And when he was cast out. Hmm. How many has ever been cast out? Well, the only thing going to be cast out of here tonight is the devil. You're going to be taken in and taken up. When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood it not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Lord, let a flame of fire fall upon us all tonight in the next few moments. Set our souls aflame. May we be that same burning bush, burning but not consumed, which means that we are a living sacrifice, constantly being sacrificed. Sacrificed every moment of the day, but still alive. Oh, glory to God. As Paul, Lord, cried, I die daily. Lord, let us even die to ourselves tonight. Let the fire fall. Lord, let us be aflame. And Lord, send an angel here too to touch every person that's in the midst because they need help tonight. Now for answers that are arriving, we thank you. Amen. Seated you may be. Moses was a little baby when he was born. Hallelujah. And do you know that most everybody is? And someone wants to stay that way forever, but God don't want you that way all the time. You will grow after a while. Is it true? Hallelujah. And Pharaoh had arisen that did not know Joseph. Joseph at his time and during his day had so wisely steered and guided the nation of Egypt that he directed it all into the coffers of the king. Pretty soon the king, who was just a powerless figurehead, owned all of Egypt because of Joseph's managing abilities. And of course that left the children of Israel in the blessed land of Goshen, and there no plagues would ever fall. If it was dark in Egypt, it was always light in Goshen. If there were locusts in Egypt, there were none in Goshen. Amen. If there were lice and frogs and murrain of beasts and boils and fire and hail and hail mixed with fire, thick black darkness, never was there such plagues upon the land of the people of God. I believe that we got a protector. I believe someone to take care of us. His name is Jesus. He has a host of angels. The church of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So there's a wall that's built all the way around you that lifts up to the sky. Jesus be a fence all around me. Oh, said the devil, God, if you'll take down the hedge around Job, I'll get him to curse you. No, you won't, said God. I'll take down the hedge just to prove it to you. And once again, Job overcame, and once again, that proved the devil a liar. Every time you overcome, you are proving the devil's a liar. The devil's going to say to God, Ha, 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 ha. I'll get them. You just watch and see. And every time you succumb to the world, the flesh, and the devil, and slip and fall and wind up in the ditch where the blind leads the blind, the devil laughs up his sleeve, and the Lord has to try again. But I'd love to prove the devil a liar tonight, wouldn't you? And I'd love to see you spend your life proving him a liar every day. Hallelujah. Pharaoh had arisen who knew not Joseph. He should have read the history books. 
He should have been thankful for his roots, his rudiments, his humble beginning. He should have thanked uh, his lucky stars for the one that had made him a king with any power at all. But he forgot Joseph and Joseph's people, the Hebrews, who now were into 430 years of bondage, suffering under Pharaoh's whip play. This Pharaoh decided that the Hebrews were multiplying too fast and they might just take over. That's what ails this world. That's what ails the humanists and the socialists and the communists and all the politicians that would like to uh, deify man instead of God. They can't stand the thought of what they call that right-wing religious element sweeping the country. Say amen. They don't like the idea. They try to say, for instance, moral majority is neither moral nor a majority. But regardless of political foundations, there are people still in this land that believes in the right. Sometimes they're hypocritical about it, but in their heart they still believe it. Lots of times they won't perform nor do it, but they still know it's right. Say amen. And if you ask them the question, they'd confess to you what they really wanted to do. Some of you would tell me tonight what you'd like to do if you just had the power to do it. Some of you want to get victory over many things in your life, but you seem to be helpless against it. What you want to do and what you're capable of doing is two different things. That's why there's got to be power from on high set upon us. Oh, said Jesus to his disciples, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. For ye shall receive the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Some people wait many years hence. They wait all their life. But if you tarry, someone said, well, you don't have to tarry anymore. Just come and get it. The Pentecost has already fallen. I got news for you. God will heal a sinner and then say, sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. But God won't give a sinner the Holy Ghost. You got to be free from sin. You must receive salvation. When you're saved and washed, then you're anointed. It's blood, water, and oil in that order and sequence. And besides, even if you're saved and cleansed tonight, and while you're listening to the Word of God, you're being cleansed again. His Word is a cleansing agent that is washing you clean. Still you must be hungry to be filled with God's Spirit. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they're the only ones that will be filled. And besides, you don't beg, pound, plead, and pray when you are to be filled. You are to just worship and praise God and worship and praise God. A hungry seeker of God who is saved, cleansed, and washed. There is no reason why if you wait in his presence that you won't renew your strength, run and not be weary, walk and not faint, and be endowed with power from on high. You cannot handle these things in yourself. It is the God within you that must handle them. A doctor cannot help you particularly if you have a spirit of infirmity. He can only help you if you've got physical disorder. He's a physical man. His medicine is physical. His instruments are physical. His cameras and x-ray machines are physical. If your affliction is not physical but from the other world, spiritual, a spirit of infirmity, then you better go find a man that operates in the spirit realm or you will never have it defeated in your life. Again, you must fight the devil on his own turf, spirit to spirit. Say amen. Two boxers will get in the ring and they'll fight each other on their own turf, physical jaw to physical jaw. Hello. Wondering why the preacher bends his ear is listening for a response. Amen. Oh, me or oh, my, one of them will fit you. Microphone is portable tonight. We can pick out the quiet spot and preach if we have to. But coexistence is just that good God, good devil doctrine where you let the devil sit in his corner and you sit in yours and you just spend the rest of your life staring at each other. That never knocked him out of the ring yet. Brother, you must fight him on his own ground because if you try to fight him in your own strength and in your own world, you will be defeated, fall flat on your face, and he'll laugh you to scorn. But brother, he's scared to death when you start to move in the Spirit of God. There's something different that transpires. He begins to realize that his bluff is about to be called. That he's lost his body in the war. When he had a body as an angel in the beginning when he fell from heaven, it didn't have any blood when he did have a body. So therefore he knows nothing about the blood. 
It confuses him. He loses his mind when you talk about it. He'd never been that route like Jesus did, who became flesh and blood and shed it that you might be saved, went back to heaven without it, glorified flesh and bone. The devil hates fire. Mm -hmm. He knows he's going to hell and torment, and every time Jesus cast out a devil, the little things would scream out saying, Oh, don't send us back to hell. Don't make us go back out into the deep. We can't stand that place. We'd rather live in the pigs than go to hell. Hell must be worse than a hog pen. Oh, I know. Amen. Say amen. Are you hearing me tonight? So the devil's afraid of fire. He's afraid of the blood. And he's afraid of you getting in the Holy Ghost because that's God himself who made him in the beginning. And the creator is always greater than the creation. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? The potter has power over the clay to make a vessel unto honor or one to dishonor. Oh, let's get filled with God that our vessel might become honorable. Hallelujah. I love him. This Pharaoh knew not Joseph, and he was afraid that these religious folks was going to take over the country. Well, if you're scared of it, get good and scared of it, because in a few more months, I'm going to be ruling the world. Hello. I said, he that overcome up, I'll give him power to rule the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and break them as a potter would a vessel to shivers. Is it true? Are you glad? I, I'm just headed for heaven. We're here tonight practicing up, getting ready to go. And I believe it's going to be better there than here. We won't be there too long before we're going to have to come back here and rule the nation. A rod of righteousness, a rule of righteousness in which everybody will get a fair shake. No rip-offs, no pay-offs, no tip-offs, no under-the-table dealings, no uh, sleight of hand or cunningly devised fables. Or It's going to be a fair shake for everybody. That's a righteous dictatorship headed up by Jesus Christ. And all those people whom he can trust, he will use in the kingdom. He that is faithful over little shall be ruler over much. If you're not faithful over that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? The scripture said. Hmm? If you're unjust in a little thing, you'll be unjust when you become president. It all starts right down where you're living. If you can be faithful over a small thing, uh, he'll make you ruler over many things. And if you have a talent and with it you've won another one, He'll say, wonderful, now rule over this city. Yet unto him that hath shall be given. The man that had five pounds gained five more, and he received power over five cities. I believe God moves according to your, your ability. And I say this, your ability can expand. You don't have to be limited in your ability. You can go around with your head hanging down and say, I'll never amount to nothing, I'll never learn nothing, I'll never know nothing. But the man whom he gave ten talents to won ten more, and in the day of judgment he gave him power over ten cities. I believe the sky is the limit. God is as big as you want to make him. Ye have not because ye ask not. If you want to be destitute and poverty stricken, that's up to you. But if you ask largely, the scripture said, your joy will be filled. Say hallelujah. Some people just want enough to barely get by. But I want a margin for operation. Say praise the Lord. Are you happy? Are you glad? This Pharaoh said, destroy all these Hebrew boys, babies. We're not going to have them around here no more. Keep the girls, the female daughters that are born, but throw the sons to the crocodiles. But the midwives feared God, and they said, no such a thing. We're not going to do that. And they spared all the boy Hebrew babies. And because they did not fear the king, but rather feared God, and didn't abort any of them. Uh, they even talk about trying to abort them when they're already born. Say amen. They feared God. You fear God, you won't commit murder. Isn't that right? Praise the Lord. They feared God, and God built them houses, the scripture said. Maybe you've spent your life trying to build a house and can't even own one or build one or 
get a roof over your head, but you start fearing God, God will build you a house. You get out of the way and let God have his way, he'll do more in two seconds than you can in your lifetime. I said, you can slave away, build yourself a shack, but if you just step aside, God would build your mansion. I'm convinced I know he'll do it. Say hallelujah. And because they feared God and obeyed God, God built them a house. Besides, I'd rather obey God and live in a shack by the side of the road than to have a mansion in disobedience and rebellion. Amen. Because I wouldn't have it long. But when God builds you a house, you can rest assured it's built and it will abide forever. A sure house and a firm foundation. Hallelujah. Now, the king heard about it and he called these midwives in and said, how come you're sparing these Hebrew sons? These boy babies. Oh, said the midwives, you don't understand, king. The Hebrew women are a little different than the Egyptian women. Aren't you glad that God's people are always different than the people of this world? If saved people do what the people in the world do, what in the world are they saved from? Some people think they're saved in their sin. They're saved from their sin. Hello. There are some people that think that once they're saved from sin, they can go back and sin again. Now it's no longer sin. Since they can never be lost, they can do anything. Nothing could be more of a damnable doctrine. If it was enough to send you to hell the first time, why wouldn't it send you to hell the second time? I mean, I've got good sanctified common sense, and I'm not too bright, but I figured that much out. The Bible said that no sin or unclean thing can enter into heaven. Hebrews, uh, Revelation 21, 8 said, But the fearful and the unbelieving and all liars are the first three on the list that's going to the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, I didn't write the book. Why don't you get rid of your fear? Fear God, there's nothing left to fear. If you're afraid all the time, that's faith in the devil. Uh, the unbelieving. Why, somebody says, I'm a good Christian. I'm one of the better Christians of Lake Wales then you better not sit back there and doubt in your heart. The Bible said, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You can be the best Christian in town, you think, and start doubting and be a non-believer in your heart and make a big fat sinner out of yourself. Uh -huh. So I said, well, I, it's just not that, Brother Freddie. It's you or that or something else that I'm doubting. You can't doubt the Word of God. And I have not spit out anything yet tonight that was not the Word of God. You've got to believe that. And Jesus said, if you can't believe for no other reason, you must believe for the work's sake. He said, you may hate me, you may despise me, it's all right, but you've got to believe God because of what's happening. Hello. How many is listening? All right. The Hebrew women are different. How so? Why, said the midwives, the Hebrew women are lively. Not as the Egyptian women, inferring they were kind of dead. <laughs> you believe God's people are lively. When the children of Israel was in the Red Sea, those Egyptians tried to go in there too. It amazes me how many people try to do what God's people do and they just can't pull it off. You can't uh, act it. Some people are good actors and they ought to be in Hollywood, but when it comes right down to it, you cannot duplicate an experience in God. For God himself made the separation in the Red Sea. They were in a different environment. There wasn't air no more. They was in water. Huh? They weren't fish. They were humans, but they were in there. They were breathing. God sent the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That pillar stood between the Hebrews and the Egyptians in the middle of the Red Sea all night long. And all night long, it was light in the camp of Israel and it was dark in the camp of the Egyptians. And to make matters worse, the Lord started looking at the Egyptians through the pillar of cloud, and their knees started knocking together. Their countenance fell, and their heart got troubled. God is looking at us. Brother, what else is known? God's looking at you tonight. There's an all seeing eye watching you. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He sees all. And if he's looking at you tonight and you're starting to get nervous and troubled and agitated, fidgety, frustrated, you might be in the wrong camp. 
when the eye of the Lord looked on to the children of Israel, it light, lit up the whole area, and they were happy and joyful to know that God was their deliverer. Now tonight when God starts moving, and you start getting upset because the Lord starts looking at you, remember, get the skeletons out of the closet. Don't worry about the cat getting out of the bag. Don't worry about the preacher spilling the beans on you. If you didn't have so much to hide, you wouldn't be in such frustration. Jesus came to your house, the old saying goes, would you let him in or would you have to send him away for one hour so you can clean the house up? Say hallelujah. Come back in an hour, I'll get all the magazines off the rack and the clothes out of the closet and the packs off the shelf and the bottles out of the fridge. Say amen. Are you hearing me now? So the Hebrew women are lively, are they? Yes, God's people are lively. There's not a dead head among them, if they're the people of God. Oh, thank God for life tonight. It might even make you shout a little. Even the pompous will shout when the Spirit of the Lord strikes them. Now they're lively, and uh, what else? Well, you see, King, every time we come in to do the service of a midwife and to help these children be born upon the stools, we find out something. What? What do you find out, said Pharaoh? That the Hebrew women are already delivered. Before we ever get in there, they don't even need our help. Hmm, the plot thickens. God's people who are lively are already delivered before you can even get the revival started. It's those dead heads that needs to be converted from one camp to the other. Turn from an Egyptian into a Hebrew. Got some life put in them. That needs all the help in their travailing and their agonizing and their bawling and their squalling. Hallelujah. And now, just give me a bunch of people that's already delivered and we'll have revival before we can get the meeting started. Now, some of you advanced Christians can sit in your seats tonight listening to the Word of God being preached and be healed. I won't have to call you out. I won't have to tell you all about it. I won't have to lay hands on your head, go into your case history, and go back to your grand grandfather and everybody else. Say amen. He sent his word and healed them. Come on, you lively saints of God. Show some life and say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You're already delivered before we can even do service. Before we can even help you. You've got your help from on high. Oh, lift up your eyes unto the hills from... Whence come of your help? Your help is coming from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. All right. Pharaoh couldn't argue with it. Moses was born. Three months old, and three months is the season. He was cast out. I know that it's an awful feeling to be cast out and to be cast down. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Thou shalt yet praise him. In the land of the living. Hallelujah. Do not be discouraged on a blue Monday night, in other words. Moses was cast out too. Rejected, ostracized. Paul talked about the offscouring of the earth. Castaways. He said, oh, I hope to God that after I preach to others, I myself will keep my body under, lest I too be a castaway. Didn't he say it? So after the preaching's all over, even the preacher's got to keep himself straight. Is it the truth? Hallelujah. Now, here's Moses in a little ark of bulrushes. As long as he's in the little boat, the crocodiles can't eat him. Poison fish can't sting him. He can't drown. Oh, to be in the ark. How many's in the ark? Hallelujah. And there, they cast the little ark out on the river just to see where God would take it. As a lot of people wouldn't have trusted God that much, especially their offspring and their son, or at least of all themselves. They would have to push the boat here or there or someplace where they know somebody would take it in, but they just couldn't leave it up to the will of God. Hello. I remember when the Philistines was wondering how in the world they got all those hemorrhoids that morning. And they said, we've been spitting in our secret parts of emeralds, which is hemorrhoids. You suppose we stole the Ark of the Covenant from Israel and we shouldn't have done it? Let's find out if we were wrong. Put that thing on a new cart and tie to two milk cows that needs milking. 
put their ball and calves in the barn and blatten away at supper time. And if they go feed the calves according to nature, it wasn't God. But if they haul that wagon back up the highway of Beth Shemesh back to Israel and they don't go to the barn to feed the calves, we'll know that it was God. And we shouldn't have touched that ark. For what's a blessing to God's people is a curse to the devil's crowd. Hello. Careful now. You just don't handle uh, the deeper things of God without it backfiring on you. Unless, of course, you're prepared for it. So at supper time, they took one step to the barn. Something turned them around. And though their bags were bursting and they needed to be milked and the cows were bawling and squalling and starving, they carried that ark on a new cart back to Israel. Contrary to nature, God leading a couple of milk cows by spirit. How much more should he be able to lead you by his spirit? I noticed the Philistines didn't pull them by the horns and pull the cow's tail and say, you're going to the barn and you're going to feed those calves. They took their hands off it. They left it alone to see where it would go. They put Moses in the ark of bulrushes and set it out on the current to see where it would go and they didn't try to dictate his course or his path. Therefore, tonight, get your hands off it and let's just see what God will do here in this meeting. Get your thumb off it and let him have his way. Don't dictate and predict and plan exactly how God's got to give it to you tonight because you're not going to get it that way. You had it all outlined for God, but God will move in ways that you could never imagine. And Pharaoh's little daughter found him. Ooh. Hey, God will give you the best if you just keep your hands off. Quit fooling with it. Quit trying to manipulate it. Quit trying to put an uh, outboard motor on the back of that ark and send it up against the current in a place where God don't want it to flow. How many is feeling the flow right now? God will give you the best. He'll give you the palace of the king. He'll give you Pharaoh's daughter who pulled him out of the water. And there she raised him for 40 years in the king's palace. And he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, intelligent and keen. What a wise man. There wasn't any education that he lacked. He knew it all. He had it all. He received it all. And yet he was missing something. For when he became 40 years old, 40 is the number of testing, he faced the test. Thank God he passed the test because there he stood saying, I've got everything in Egypt, but there's something missing in me. I've got a vacuum and a void. I feel like there's something so wrong that I have no purpose for living. I've got people somewhere and somehow my bones tells me these are not my people. He had no way of knowing except by the spirit that he belonged to another crowd. And God put it in his heart to go visit his people, the Hebrew slaves. The next in line ruler, the heir to Egypt's throne. If you please, Moses would have been the next Pharaoh. I said he would have been the next Pharaoh. There was no man so mighty in word indeed as Moses. Hallelujah. Something happened to him out there in the wilderness because after a while, after 40 years, he couldn't talk no more. God had to teach him to talk all over again. And yet, Stephen in his sermon in Acts 7 said he was mighty in word and deed. Say amen. God had to teach him a lot of things all over again. Some people that know it all and figure they got it all are going to learn again in a backwards direction, I believe. Because the spirit realm is backwards to the natural realm. If you want to go up, you've got to come down. If you want to live, you've got to die. If you want to receive, you've got to give. If you want to find, you've got to lose. If you want to be worthy, you must confess I'm unworthy. If you want to get clean, Naaman, jump in Jordan's mud and come out clean of your leprosy. You see how it works? Here was Moses, 40 years old, missing something. Would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know why? He was so wise that he knew, like Solomon, the wisest man on earth, vanity of vanities, always vanity, the pleasures of sin is pleasurable, but only for a season. And there's no way to bring it back. And he hated with frustration the idea of it all. So he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God because in the affliction there is a reward. In the cross there is a crown. In the dying there is a living again. It's a faithful saying 
worthy of all acceptation. If you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. Huh? Praise God. If you die for him, you'll live with him. If you deny him, he'll deny you. Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And not a thing he promised that he can renege on and go back on. He's faithful. He will not deny you anything of his 33,000 promises in the book of the Word of God. Okay, you love his word tonight. Looking here, just a few moments more. Moses is down visiting his people like you had been put in your heart tonight to come down here and visit your people. Some of you never met before. There are new faces here tonight. Now, I'll be a couple more minutes and God will heal you. Otherwise, if you go home, you're going to miss your miracle. Amen. God's going to work miracles here. Or otherwise, get two for one, two hours rest for every hour of sleep. Tomorrow, I promise you the world will still revolve if you don't show up. You're not so important as you think you are. Say amen. There's only one that cares. And if you'd cast your care on him tonight, you'd find out that regardless of your carnal reason, God's got his own way of performing and giving you exactly what you need to make you happy and keep you eternally. Society can give you temporary things for just a little while, but what you're going to get tonight will never leave you nor forsake you, even to the end of the age. Say praise the Lord. God put it in your heart to be here tonight. Would you come here and waste your time? Would we put together an hour of this person's time, an hour of that person's time, and another hour of another person's time? After a while, you've got an awful lot of wasted time on your hands if you're just here to waste time. And to go home before your miracle proves you've wasted time. You might as well never came. Say amen. Someone says, you're bold, Brother Freddy. You ain't seen nothing yet. I haven't kicked it in an overdrive. Hallelujah. Are you happy? I wouldn't waste a minute of your time if it was not edifying and uplifting and uh, causing you to grow in God. Why, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Say amen. Is it true? God put it in your heart to be here. Some of you left your old dirty dishes in the sink right at 7 o'clock to be here at 7.30 because you're afraid you're just going to miss something. The same thing happened to Moses. God put it in his heart to go visit his people. And he didn't even know it was his people. And some of you didn't know this was your kind until you got here. Say hey, amen. You've been looking for your people and you found them. Here's old Moses down here in Egypt. Down with the slaves. Boy, this is a far cry from where I, I've been living high on the hog. But boy, I sure do feel good here. Them's my kind. Hallelujah. How many knows you, you'll find your kind? You'll know your kind when you find them. So he looks around. He says, boy, I can't stand this. There's an Egyptian beaten up on a Hebrew. So he slips up and kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand, thinking he did a wonderful service. After all, even though he was in the Egyptian category, he knew that the devil had no right beating up on the people of God. Hello. Well, he went back home, didn't think much about that because, after all, he was a liberated person and people in bondage can't see straight. They have no perspective. Their understanding is just so finite. They're so bound, you see. Scales on their eyes and plugs in their ears. Rust in their soul, cobwebs in their brain. Hello. But the next day, it happened again. Just like it's going to happen to you tomorrow for tomorrow night. He went to see his people again. said, I had a good time there knocking the devil in the head yesterday and setting that child of God free. And I believe I'll go back again today. Amen. So back he came. And this time was a different story. Like tomorrow night's service is going to be different than tonight. There are never two of them the same. This time there were two Hebrews fighting among themselves. My, I'm growing up fast, said Moses. God's let me see it all real quick. Huh? He said, boys, 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 it's bad enough to have the devil on your back yesterday without fighting among yourselves today. Hello? Anybody know what I said? And he was to separate them, you know, 
You get some of God's people fighting among themselves, you can't possibly separate them. They won't let you do it. They'll keep ragging that and nagging that and hashing that up on and on. Separate, stop this. And who do you think you are? Who made you a judge and a lawgiver over us? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Why, you ingrate, said Moses. You could have talked all day and not said that. Now I've got a flea. Surely it's known. Hmm. I don't care how deep you bury some of your actions in the sand, it'll always be known. Somebody will spout it. The bird of the air will tell the matter, and that which have wings will carry it. Say so, amen. All right. Then he fled for the next 40 years, the next period of his life, the next testing period of his life. He had to leave Egypt. And this is the, the title of my little message tonight. Moses had to leave Egypt in order to rule Egypt. I wish I could repeat that a thousand times. Moses had to leave Egypt in order to rule Egypt. Oh, he was in line to be the next pharaoh. He'd have had enemies. He'd have had competition. He'd have had people trying to jerk the rug out from underneath him and stab him in the back. He might have been strong enough to kill all his contemporaries and his peers and all his jealous rivals. He might have ruled Egypt, but he wouldn't have ruled all of Egypt. He'd have ruled his political party. He would not have really ruled the Hebrews. They had another God. So, amen. He never quite had a handle on Egypt anyhow until he left Egypt. Then he became nothing. Everything was gone. He chose it. The reproach of Christ. He esteemed it greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Forty years in the wilderness. Had to learn to talk all over again. Just the shepherd. But after 40 years in the testing and he went to the very lowest, died out and the vision perished, suddenly at the end of 40 years, an uh, angel appeared and a flame came upon a bush that burning was not consumed and Moses heard a voice speaking out of the bush saying, I am that I am. I've raised thee up and I'm sending thee back to rule Egypt and to bring my people out of bondage. You can never be a great leader until you leave Egypt. Does anybody know what Egypt is a type of throughout the Bible? It's a type of the world. Egypt always refers to the world. Woe unto he that goes down to Egypt for help. For the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. Cursed be he that trusts in man or leaneth upon the arm of man. Woe to he that goes to Egypt for help. Thy help cometh from the Lord. Now, Egypt is always a type of the world always has been and you have to come out from the world before you can ever be a powerful leader in Christianity or with the people of God or of those Hebrews who were once slaved and now liberated and set free God's freeborn men and women say amen. amen you have to leave Egypt he might have been a ruler of thoughts then he had no real promise but when he chose God's way of living best of all and he left Egypt and he died out to nothingness. Then he revived again, survived again, raised again, resurrected again, rose again after the next 40 year testing. He passed his second test and God said, all right, now you're ready to rule Egypt. And to Egypt he went with a stick in his hand. Didn't look like much, but what a mighty scepter it was. He had the stick, God had the ability between the two, the stick ability. Delivered three million people. Every time he swung his scepter, lice came, hail came, frogs came, flies came, boils came, every manner of plague. He was ruling Egypt. Pharaoh gnashed his teeth. Pharaoh's henchmen just chewed their teeth to the gum, tore the hair out of the head, cursed and roared and shrieked and foamed and rose up in frustration trying to defeat this man and they had to connect they had to yield and bend and bow the knee like every knee shall bow and every tongue shall one day confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God all things will be placed beneath his feet he will rule my friend he'll rule not this planet only but the entire universe for he is the God of the universe 
the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the image of the invisible God. Ooh, glory. You will see him, and when I shall see him, I don't want to look on him whom I have pierced. I want to see him who outshines the sun, leading his army. Hallelujah. Thank God. Moses left Egypt, had to, and when God raised him up and brought him back, then and only then could he be a ruler and a leader in Egypt and rule Egypt he did. He brought the Hebrews out. When he got through of Egypt, there was nothing left but a shambles, just a darkened, charred mass of destruction. Just a wake of absolute annihilation. He had conquered Egypt. He had ruled it. He had all power over Egypt. The power he would have never had had he stayed there. And it looked impossible to natural reason. But when he left Egypt, God brought him back. And then's when he really ruled the nation of Egypt. How many can see that tonight? Hallelujah. This Moses was no different than you and I. He's the meekest man on the face of the earth. He wasn't probably that way to start with, but he learned a lot in the wilderness. And God may put you through a process wherein you're going to learn a lot too. But when you pass the test and the second 40 is over with, you're going to come back. And the very thing that you forsook, the very thing you sacrificed, turned your back on, gave it up, gave it to God, God's going to turn around and give it back to you. And where you never would have ruled before, now you're going to rule. Well, you might have ruled in haphazard, slipshod, small portions. Now you're going to rule with a mighty rod of iron. Oh, thank God. Don't you want to be able to rule Egypt? Most people can't handle Egypt. Even when they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Their daddy's got $10 million. They've got everything a little old heart's desire. Education. They've got everything going their way. They want for nothing. Lots of fat on their bones. They still can't handle the world. The world puts them under every time. And you're never going to rule it until you leave it. I'm not talking about the rapture of the church. That's coming too. But you've got to come out from among it. Touch not, taste not, handle not the unclean thing and turn your back upon it. And when you do, God will bring you around after you pass the test. And he processes you. And you will rule this world. Brother, maybe the world's ruling you. But I'm not going to give up till I rule the world. I'm not just... I'm not just talking about coming back of Jesus to rule the nations. I want to rule it tonight. I don't want there nothing outside that door to be able to be my master and whip me and overcome me. That world is going to be underneath my thumb and underneath my control, underneath my foot by the power of God that lies within me. That God within me is going to do it for me because I've rejected it. I've lifted it. I've run off and turned my back upon it. Therefore, I'm going to have power over it. Jesus said the prince of this world cometh, but he hath nothing in me. Nothing on me. Nothing against me. There's not a thing that he can condemn me or accuse me of that's true. Therefore, he can't put nothing on me. Can't make me sick. He can't send me to hell. He can't afflict me. He can't put that old headache, backache, or cancer on me at all. Got no excuse to touch me of a thing. Aren't you glad? You want to rule Egypt? Then you'll have to leave it. But when God brings you back to it, you'll have power over it. It'll have no effect. It'll be like water off a duck's back. You can stand there and look temptation in the eye. It'll never phase you again. Say hallelujah. I'm sick and tired of the world ruling you and me. We're going to rule Egypt. Let's leave it. Let's make a promise to leave it tonight. Let God process us any way he wants to. But when we pass our test, we will return and have power over this world. Thank God. Ho, ho, ho. Love not the world. Or anything that's in it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in, in him. The world passes away, the lust of love, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. How many Moses wants to rule Egypt today? I want you that want to rule Egypt, that is the world. You're tired of it ruling you. You want to rule the world? Get ready to leave it right now by standing to your feet. Stand your feet. The prayers for the soul. I'm praying for every person tonight that wants power over the things of this world that up until now you've had no power over. The reason you've had no power over it because you've not been willing to leave it. But if you come out from among it tonight and turn your back upon it, God is no respecter of persons. What he'll do for Moses, he'll do for you. 
when he speaks to you through the burning bush, set on fire, burning but not consumed. Whoa, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, that's you. When he's all done processing you, you will return. You'll leave this meeting tonight. You'll walk out that door. You'll face tomorrow with all power over the world that previously had all power over you. You want power over the world, then you've got to leave it. Somebody I'm willing to go should Jesus come tonight. Hey, you're going to have to leave the world before you leave the world. Yeah. How many knows what I mean? Praise. I said you'll leave the world before you leave the world. Put up your hand and let's pray. Oh God, tonight our first prayer of faith. Here on this opening night of the three nights that we are to be here in Lake Wales at this little church. We are praying at this prayer, at this time, that you will make a Moses out of every man and woman, boy and girl who stood. Lord, they are willing to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for season. Oh Lord of hosts, we esteem the approach of Christ much more than the treasures of Egypt. We fear not the wrath of the king. We forsake Egypt as Moses did, knowing that in the re-reward that there is a great power over all that has rode roughshod over us before. I'm asking now that you make new creatures and powerful Moseses out of all who are standing. God, we leave the world. That's why we stood. Help us now to back up our vows and our promise. Let them not be empty words. We leave the world. Even in the hour of temptation, we turn our back that we may return to have all power over it again. Oh, hallelujah. We're never going to be a ruler among God's people. Never going to be a spiritual leader. We're not going to rise to the heights or accomplish what our heart longs to do until we forsake Egypt. Then God will bring us back to rule it, and rule it we will. One day the nations will be ruled by the saints of God who have left Egypt previously. Lord, I'm praising you now that everyone who stood did so because they've made a covenant to leave behind them that which has no future. And pretty soon they'll be back to rule and to decide their own destiny and their own future will be to God. Everyone says, thank God it's happening to me. Glory be to God. Wonderful Jesus, praise him, all you people. You're simply telling God that you're going to leave Egypt. That's all. You can never be what you want to be until you do. And when you do, God will bring you back, and you'll have everything you ever wanted. Hallelujah. Thank God. We will be in control when we do return. Even tonight, we leave what we cannot handle, and God will soon bring us back to handle it. Thank God. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a beautiful truth tonight. Blessed be the Lord of hosts. And everyone said, thank God. Praise him, all ye people. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. He is to me. Worship and adore him. Bow down before him. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Glory to God in the highest. I love him better every day. The last few moments tonight of tonight's service, we want to pray just a few more prayers. And the first prayer, I believe, is answered. How many believes it is? Can you feel something in your soul that's different? This is not imagination. Don't you feel a load lifted off you when you made a decision with God to just turn your back upon that which has rolled over you roughshod, the world that's controlled you? Now, when you come back, maybe even so soon that as soon as you walk out this door tonight or face tomorrow, it might be that soon. You're going to control the world. You might as well do it because you're going to have to know how to do it when you come back to rule it. You've got to rule it anyhow. Know ye not, you should judge angels, the scripture said. You've got to learn how to judge and rule these things in your own life. Greater is he that rules his own spirit than he that takes a city. Hallelujah. You're great if you can control a city, but you're greater if you rule your own spirit. That's what the scripture said. In the truth, well, I love him better every day. Go ahead and praise God. Ooh, hallelujah. Thank God. We've got a few prayers we're going to pray. Have you enjoyed the word of God preached tonight? 
Glory to God. Thank God. Dad standing here, step out and be the first to be prayed for now, if you will. We're going to ask God to touch your body tonight and heal you. Hallelujah. That okay, Dad? Yes, amen. You need that? Yes, amen. Raise your hands. I'm not going to let you sit for the first couple of cases because I want you to get used to how the preacher feels standing on his feet all night. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Dad, look. Look at me. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for you as the Lord leads me, okay? Amen. There's a little dullness getting in your ears here, in your hearing. We're going to ask God to open it up. You believe he will? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, don't be surprised. They're going to open now. Secondly, you have stiffening that has settled to your back here, all down to your spine. That's going to relinquish. That's the first stage of arthritis of the spine. It's going to leave you. You've been tight here in your chest, in your breathing in your chest. On the left side, a little worse. That's going to free you. The last thing I want you to do is this. Don't ever be afraid. Do never fear or be afraid of cancer. Don't ever be afraid of cancer. Hallelujah. Job said, the thing I feared came upon me. Didn't he say it? But when this fear leaves, the strength of anything is the fear of it. Did you know that? This fear is going to leave that. He's not going to have this or ever have this. And what he does have tonight, we just name, God's going to remove that. Oh, Lord, loose the arthritis from his spine. In fact, from every joint of his bones. Now, touch his chest, lungs, especially the heart. On the left side, being the heart, heal it now. On stop his ears. Give him his hearing. Even now, give him loudness and clarity of hearing. Praise the Lord. A little louder over here, Dad. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You hear that? Thank you, Jesus. A little bit clearer over yes. here, too. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, take my hand. We're going to take a little step of faith here. Wonderful Jesus, yes. Glory be to God. Ooh. Now, move your neck and your shoulder blades along your spine and see if you've loosened up there any at all. Yeah, there's nothing there. There's nothing been there much as far as that goes. Well, it's a little looser now that what? Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, stitching time saves nine, Dad. Yeah. And it was bad enough to be here, and I'm glad we caught it when we did. Amen. Praise the Lord. Even your hearing is just a little bit louder now. Amen. Praise Glory to God. Lord. Take a deep breath. Something like a load has rolled off your chest. Praise Glory to God. And you keep on shouting the victory like you are, not much will come upon you. And don't ever be afraid of cancer. It's not going to come on your skin. It's not going to come in your organs. It's not going to ever be within you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Everyone said praise the Lord. Come on, sister. You believe God will touch you too? Raise your hand. Look at me. You have a little tension drawing that bothers you at your neck, the back of your neck and through here. Is that true? That's right. <laughs> it's going to leave you also. God will heal you number two tonight. Second person. Secondly, in your own body you have trouble with a tiredness, exhaustion, a weariness of the flesh. Hmm? Right. This is exactly in your blood. Your blood is low in its content. That's like low blood or tired blood. Mm -hmm. Take a step of faith. Since your blood's gone low, you've had some poor circulation in your legs, in your legs, particularly around your feet. Your feet get numb and they lose feeling in your feet. They're going to come alive when your blood rises. You're going to have more feeling in the feet as the blood rises. Someone said, praise the Lord. You happy? Uh -huh. Now this is very small, but you might as well have it in your sinus. God's going to clear it up and make it 
wide open. Good. <laughs> it's going to happen. Everyone said, praise the Lord. Again, I did know, not know this until just a moment ago as I left the sinus. But something draws in one of your shoulder blades. One of your shoulder blades. God is loosening you of this. I just noticed it just then. Once in a while, I'll even feel it myself. When one suffers, we all suffer. We're in the body. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Was he not? Now, the last thing I'm praying for you for is you, you have a little ministry that God's give you. And this, is, this concerns you more than anything. If you was never healed, you're concerned about this ministry the most. Your ministry... Huh? That's right. Your, keep your hands up. Don't be surprised. I know it's been a few years since we've been at this church, but God's still on the throne. He still talks. He's not mute nor dumb nor got laryngitis. He can talk all he wants to. Your ministry is exactly this. It's a ministry of helps. A ministry of helps. This is what God's gives you. A ministry of help. You're gonna, you've been a great help, but you're going to be a greater help. Hallelujah. Some of your tasks are menial. They seem small, but they will grow. Who hath despised the day of small things? They will grow to greater things. God, even now, raise up for ministry that it may expand. It's a ministry of helps, but it's growing. Now, God. Who's her name? Raise her blood. The feeling go clear back to her feet. Hallelujah. Everyone said it's down. We will be to God. Everyone said it is down. Come, sister, in the green. Before you go, little sister, move your neck and tell me only the truth. What happened to it? He's gone. Really? Yeah. How long had it bothered you or annoyed you? It's been about five weeks. Five weeks? How come you can't feel feel nothing wrong with it now? The Lord healed me. Oh, wiggle your toes and feel that little warm feeling in them. That's just a sign of you that your blood's up. They've been cold for five weeks. <laughs> They've been cold for a long time. Longer. Cold for more than five weeks. Are they cold now? No. <laughs> That's quite surprising. You don't even have any shoes on. Hallelujah. You believe God will heal you? Yes, sir. Have I ever prayed for you? Not sir. Well, I'm sorry. I'll make up for lost prayer. I like to pray for folks for the first time anyway. Some of you folks have been prayed for before. I've prayed for you before. I'll pray for you again, but give me a chance for some of these moments. You have a condition that bothers you in, like a little fullness that fills in your throat. Is that right? Right. You come over here, God will give you a new throat. I was like, that's pretty presumptuous to stand around there and say God's going to do this and God's going to do that. Well, I'm just repeating what I've seen over the past 24 years of pounding the roads every night watching God do the same thing. I don't see why this Monday night should be any different than any other night for God. Hey, I wish somebody answered that telephone. Yeah, tell them we're having revival and they ought to have been down here. If they get here right now, they might even get a miracle before they go home. I, God's loosening your throat tonight. You have had something wrong in your thyroid. Is that true? True. God is going to heal your thyroid with a shot of biodine tonight. Hold still, here's your shot. That is. Hold on. Now listen. Secondly, you want me to quit there or pray for it all? All of it. All right. God's also going to touch you in your legs. There's a stiffening that comes to your leg. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now that's your second miracle. I can quit there if you want me to. Nope. You mean you won't let me? Nope. I would have quit, but she won't let me. All right. If she won't let me, I'm going to pray on. The third condition afflicting you off and on has to do with your stomach area here. In the lower part of your stomach is in your digestive tract. Is that right? Right. God's going to heal you. Heal the stomach and the intestinal tract that's backing it up. 
Everyone said, praise the Lord. Again, you've been a little bit lightheaded and dizzy. Dizzy spelled. Yes. They come three or four times a day, but they're worse in the afternoon between three and four o'clock. That's the worst time of the day. That's going to be the high point of your day after this. Glory to God. I, st I still don't have it all. You have weakness in your wrist, your right wrist. Is that true? God's going to heal your wrist. And you've got a place that's bad in your spine. You have to be careful about bending and lifting. Something will go out along these vertebrae. God will straighten out. You'll feel it straighten in a minute. Yes. Feel this wrist. Jesus name. Ah. Snapped a little, but it's all right now. God take her dizzy spells. No more will she have them. You've healed her thyroid and her throat. Stiffening, leave the joints of her legs. She suffered that too long, too. Stomach track made new, and everyone said it's new. Take a step of faith with me. Whoa, Jesus, I love you, Lord. Boy, I want to check first. How's your legs feel? Good. Would you swallow and tell me you can feel the lump in there now? okay what did you feel in there before it was a tightness and i couldn't hardly swallow at times well go ahead and swallow it this time is it tight it's, it's fine fine is your head clear of the di dizziness yes sir are you healed tonight yes sir questions if you're sore or bothered here right. eat something you like before you go to bed tonight sleep like a baby okay you're healed come to the sister God, you may be seated. You did well by standing as long as you did. Do you have any idea what the preacher's going through now every night? Oh, praise you want God to heal you? Praise the Lord, yes. Did you come to be healed? No, I just come to hear the word of God. But since God's got healing for you, you would not refuse it? Oh, no. no. Good, you're a candidate. Now look at me. There's been a little tickle, Bob.